Hello and welcome to HPA Global Insights, where we'll be interviewing experts from the dietary supplement, nutritional ingredient, and overall natural health food industry. Please like, subscribe, turn on that little notification bell, and comment below. Now on with the show. Hi, welcome to the show. Today we have a special guest, Asa Waldstein, the principal and founder of Supplement Advisory Group. Asa, how's it going? Oh, it's great. Jeff, it's so good to see you. And thank you so much for inviting me on your program. I look forward to this really fun discussion today. Thank you. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about entering the U.S. market. And of course, the U.S. market is the biggest market in the world for dietary supplements. Everyone and their brother and sister want to be in this market, but it's very competitive. Um, it, there's lots of things to consider, not just you know marketing and money and how to get in and, and get your little tiny piece of the pie, but labeling. We'll talk about labeling and manufacturing and, and uh, regulations and marketing. So let's dive in. Um, about yourself, let's talk a little bit first about, you know, people that don't know you. Lots of people in this industry know you. You've been around for a while. What, what do you guys are, uh, do over at Supplement Advisory Group? And I know you're involved in some other things like other associations and op and whatnot. So then Cer give us... Certainly. And just kind of start the story and then I'll jump to current times. I started making supplements in 2001, and really the Wild West days of dietary supplements. So I've really grown up in the industry and seen the implementation of many of these regulations, GMPs for, for dietary supplements is the biggest one. And after being in a boardroom or conference room for 20 years and saying, well, here's what we shouldn't do, but here's another lower risk way to get the same marketing message across in a way that's truthful, not misleading. That's what really informs me today. So at my company, Print Supplement Advisory Group, we love analyzing marketing risk in the web, social media labels, and then helping our clients come up with lower risk but effective verbiage. And I'm also a member of APA, the American Herbal Products Association. That's one of the top trade groups for the dietary supplement and hemp cannabinoid industry. And I have the great honor of being chair of their cannabis committee, which is their largest committee at APA. Awesome. Yeah, CBD, that's a, it's a big one. That's a whole nother show. <laughs> that's awesome, though. All right, so let's, let's kind of dive in. And first step is you know, obviously in any market, you're, you're going to look at like, what, what are we going to make? Where are we going to make it? It's got to be manufactured. So what type of things do you see or give advice, you know, when, when companies want to enter the U.S. market in terms of manufacturing? Sure. So if you're going to enter the U.S. market and sell a, di a finished dietary supplement product, which is what we're talking about today, the product actually has to be manufactured in an FDA registered facility. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the U.S., but it has to be an FDA registered facility. And those guidelines are CFR Part 111, which are the regulations which cover dietary supplement manufacturing. So one, the product has to be manufactured in this compliant facility. Number two is labeling. It's got to be in the correct supplement fact panel layout. And there's something called adverse event reporting for anything sold in the U.S. So anything sold in the U.S. needs to have either a domestic address or phone number on the label. Website is not sufficient. And that's so a consumer in the U.S. could report if they had an adverse event, you know, a stomach ache or, or maybe something a little worse like that. Yeah, so in terms of manufacturing, um, we'll touch on that a little bit. You know, sometimes companies contact us and, and you know, want, well, you know, you're, you're in the U.S., can you help us or whatever? <clears throat> and there's always that question right away is, is, is manufacturing. Should we manufacture, you know, currently where we're manufacturing in our country of origin and ship it into the U.S. or manufacture in the U.S.? And, you know, I guess my, my take on that is it really depends. but. Um, I think it really comes down to your consumer group, who are you targeting? And a lot of consumers in America are, are not used to buying products that say, you know, supplements anyways, if, if you look in the back says made in and it's another country. Um, I think it's kind of similar with, with US movies. We're not used to watching movies with subtitles, you know? Uh, so I think that's a consideration. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. If a company was going to, come into the US or bring their, their dietary supplement line to the US, if it's possible, I would say 
develop a strategic alliance or partnership with a US-based manufacturer. Perhaps the company could provide the raw materials or perhaps even the bulk blend, but have that finished that product encapsulated or put into a liquid, put into a bottle and labeled in the US. That would really be my strategy for reducing risk, risk and also you know, streamlining efficiency. And as you mentioned, Jeff, you know, not having to potentially list a made in another country, whatever that may be made in China, um, that, that, that potentially could be a detractor for the, for the US supplement audience. Yeah, I think there's probably some exceptions there, like maybe Manuka honey, you know, you know, made in New Zealand or, you know, coming out of Australia, somewhere like that. You kind of expect that if you know what Manuka is and you, and you take that, it's kind of like you, maybe you want to see that it's from New Zealand or Australia. But I think by and large, by and large if a company is going to move to scale, I think definitely, you know, manufacturing the U.S. and, you know, in hitting the points you made earlier, like, you know, if you're going to work with, an, with a contract manufacturer, you know, they're going to be GMP, you know, registered or certified. There's a lot of things that tick boxes there that you don't have to worry about. Um, next step. Okay. So we've got a product, we know where we're going to make it or whatever. And now we got the label to deal with coming from a foreign country. What, 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 let's touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So we want to make sure again, the labels in the proper supplement fact panel layout, and it also has the correct product name listing. So you wouldn't want to put an obscure name, uh, for example, a, a a name that is not recognized by the FDA in the U.S. You know, botanical names commonly are safe, but common names there's only some co common names that are accepted in the U.S. on a dietary supplement label. And there's actually a wonderful book put out by APA called Herbs of Commerce. So whenever I'm putting together a dietary supplement label, I go to my Herbs of Commerce book and say oh, is this an accepted common name? If it's not in there, I try to use that correct common name or use the botanic or scientific name. Yeah, that's, a, well, especially with botanicals, because you've got the common names, you've got, uh, in some cases, maybe slang names, Keep, people have come up with different, you know, names for these, and then you get your, the, you know, the Latin version of that. And then if you're in another language, and it's, you know, for example, Chinese medicine or something like that, you've got the pinyin or English version of that in Chinese, which would be, you know, linger or something like a mushroom, but nobody knows what that is. <laughs> right. Yep. De definitely. That'd be an example of something that, you know, perhaps you could put that, you know, that pinyin name or something in a parenthesis if you want to attract, you know, that type of demographic in the U.S., but then it would have to be, you know, an accepted common name or, you know, Latin name. Exactly. Definitely. All right. We'll stay on label a little bit. Okay. And I think this is a good, we were talking before, and I think this is a good time to bring up China a little bit over the years. Of course, we're, you know, what I do, we're focused on China a lot. Um, and we've gotten, we've got lots of relationships in China, of course, and friends and companies and whatnot. And a lot of those are some Chinese medicine companies that in China, they sell traditional Chinese medicine as a drug, or in some cases as an OTC. And that's how they're approved and registered in China. And then they want to take those and sell them in America. And in some cases, those could be 100% botanical and with no kind of pharmaceutical ingredients in them whatsoever. But we want to make sure that those, a couple of things, are those botanicals, you know, where are they, were they existing in the market prior to 1994 for Deche or do they need an NDI? Um, you know, and then also the claims. So, I mean, yep. let's talk about that a little bit. I'm sure you've come across that. This is, this is a fun conversation. So if there's a very obscure, obscure herb that was not used in the U.S. Uh, you know, food supply before 1994, then yeah, it, it probably, sh you should probably think about putting it through the new dietary ingredient notification pathway. Uh, there, I will say that there's not a lot of enforcement in there, especially if it's for a raw herb, if you get specialized herbal extracts that elevates the, the likelihood that you would need to put it through a rigorous new dietary ingredient notification um, path, which is, which is a lot. And it, and it can be kind of expensive. Now talking about TCM, if I was a company coming in and my, my great dietary supplement products that I were making were TCM, what I would do is I would call them you know, TCM therapeutics. But the reason I bring up this example is I wouldn't want to use the word medicine because medicine would, would give the 
would actually allude to the fact that the product's not a dietary supplement, it's a medicine. So there's big, you know, big differentiation as we're aware in the US. A dietary supplement is to supplement the diet and a drug treats, diagnoses, prevents, cures diseases. And so that's why the medicine connotation is something that I would, I'd wanna stay away from. And then there's claims, 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 claims. This is really the biggest way to wave a red flag at the FDA, FTC, or even the plaintiff attorneys, which I don't know if we're gonna talk about today, but they're, they're kind of the third regulatory body that, ha that ha in, in you know, regulatory body with a lot of quotes that uh, can, can, can really um, you know, give a company a hard time when it comes to class action lawsuits. Sure. So claims is something we wanna be very careful of. And this is not just on the actual product labels. Let's say we're making a product and it is TCM therapeutics, and it, you could you could talk about um, the product name. Although it, you wouldn't want to use a claim in the name, you wouldn't want to say like cholestin or you know or something like that. It has to be a non medical claim in the product name. Let's say there's no claims on the label. It's manufactured correctly. It's in the correct supplement fact panel. It's got the domestic street address or phone number. Well, good. You've got that taken care of. Now, how do you sell it? Most of the enforcement these days is happening through online marketing claims because especially during the pandemic, there wasn't a lot of FDA inspections of facilities. They did some virtually, but very few, and but those are picking back up. So most of the warning letters or enforcement comes from, comes from online claims. So people may say, well, you know, I know that I'm not going I shouldn't use the word anxiety on my label, but I like to think of everything in marketing as an extension of the label. That's the kind of perspective or mindset I like to, I like to talk about. So we wouldn't use the word anxiety on the label. That would be a claim, certainly or a, drug, a disease or drug claim, but companies might inadvertently use a meta tag. Those are the things that attract people to come to your website, consumers to come to your website. You might, a company might inadvertently use a hashtag anxiety on social media in a YouTube video that links back to their shopping cart. Um, blogs, blogs were seeing claims cited in warning letters all the time where a company is writing these informational or educational blogs with the purpose of attracting people in and then selling their products. So there's a lot of nuances that go, go into how do you market your product effectively without inadvertently turning it into a drug? Yeah. And with, I, and I think staying with that Chinese medicine thing, because I think it's kind of unique um, in terms of foreign products coming into the market and just the way they're, they're, they're regulated in China. So for example, Chinese medicine has a lot of, for those that aren't familiar with Chinese medicine, they have a lot of claims or kind of diagnosis, if you will, that deal with things that you would never hear or see in other countries, such as this product clears liver heat, or this product you know, has to do with the temperatures in Chinese medicine, cold, hot, or dispels wind, you know, and these type of things. So in Chinese medicine, these are definitely claims and medical claims inside of TCM. But outside of that, how, how would those, do you think, how do those fly in terms of making, because most people I think in the US would read that and go, what, what, what is that? What does that even mean? Yep, I, I think so. And in, in the US, in terms of enforcement trends, I think it's completely fine to say something dispels heat or, um, you know, or uh, helps dispel liver heat or something like that. I think these are very low risk. Dispels liver heat is a little higher risk than dispels heat because you're kind of adding a little more details or structure, mm. structure function to that. Still very unlikely to get a warning letter for any of those type of terminologies. Now, when- Yeah, when, in that when, case, like you just said, like in that case, you're adding a structure. You're adding yes. liver to that, to that um, saying. Yeah, and I'd say we're, that's a great point. And I'd also say, Jeff, where companies are going to then in a, across the line into that, that claims category is by then explaining what the liver heat is. Liver heat can uh, express as, um, you know, ex eczema, psoriasis by, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure if that's correct, but I think it might be. Sure. By, by talking, by explaining what these, term, these terms and this terminology means, in drug terms, then they've linked their product to a drug claim by saying it's good for liver heat and liver heat's good for eczema or psoriasis, sure. for this example. Yeah, then, you, then you're getting yourself in trouble. 
All right. So again, those, I guess those companies really, the labeling is first step. And as you said, it, it's just an extension of labeling is the marketing and the websites and all the other things like that. So um, marketing, just to kind of finish up on that, what, what, what do you think has changed in terms of marketing um, in terms of entering the market and how this, how, how we're living through this COVID and how, you know, social media and web sales and Amazon and it just, you know, the sales on internet and online is just huge. Yep. And indeed, definitely social media, um, you know, and, and including YouTube, I'm including YouTube in that two years ago or so, we never saw any warning letters citing claims made in videos on YouTube. Now that's very common. And the FTC just mm -hmm. came out with an administrative complaint just a few weeks ago where they cited claims made on TikTok. That was the first, that was the first time I saw that. They're also continuing to look a little deeper into claims made by affiliates. So a company may not necessarily be handling the product, but they may be saying, oh, this product's great for my, I'll use the anxiety. Here, you can buy this here, sending it to another party where they're actually purchasing that. There's affiliate, um, the, the enforcement, enforcement on affiliate claims is happening a lot more. Definitely more on social media, we're seeing, you know, you know blogs, infographics. So a company may say, my product is used for this, 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 it, that infographics are showing up more and more. And, um, and, you know, definitely product reviews. A few years ago, we didn't necessarily see product reviews on a website or maybe even on a social media. Oh, here's an interesting one. If, uh, if, a, if a customer was to write a product review or testimonial on a Facebook wall, this product worked great for my insomnia. Now, is the FDA gonna call that a claim? Well, I don't know. They're, they're, maybe this customer is allowed to write whatever they want on your Facebook wall, but if the company likes that, retweets it, substantiates it in any way, then they're, in, they're endorsing that claim. And that's something that is definitely a yeah. new enforcement trend that we see. Yeah, so I think it gets, there's a really kind of big gray area there in terms of, public opinion versus um, marketing. So for example, if I bought a product and then I went on my personal Facebook page and I just wrote, you know, I, I have not been able to sleep for years and I've tried all these different things and nothing ever worked. And guys, I'm just here to tell you, I bought this one at store X, um, you know, or online or whatever. And this thing really worked for me. And mm -hmm. so if you're having trouble sleeping, you might want to try it out. And if there's no way to buy it from me, or there's no linkage of, of commerce there, I don't think there's really a problem with that because it's my personal opinion. It's my own personal web, you know, like Facebook page, right? If there's no material connection or commerce, as you, as you said, then you're allowed to say whatever you want. Yeah, um, so of course the company is going to like that. And like you gonna, said, they're going to like that. And like you said, I think the danger is that their marketing part, part department gets excited about it and says, hey, well, look at this guy. He's got a lot of followers and he just said this. Let's let's like it or let's let's retweet it or re, you know, I don't know what the term is for re-Facebooking, just sharing. Um, and then now you've kind of closed the loop. Exactly. Uh, and exactly. FTC might be like, oh, hey, what are you doing there? Yes, exactly. By by resharing it or, or sharing it, that would definitely um, that would definitely you know, make, make a company, you know, responsible for that claim. They, that's part of advertising. So they'd have to be truthful, not misleading. I like to say, just say no to late night retweeting during the pandemic. There was a couple warning letters that came out. I think they're joint FDA, FTC warning letters where it was something having to do with a, COVID, a, a product or some have to do with something with COVID, COVID related. It's a year ago, so I can't really recall. Mm -hmm. And a company in particular, they retweeted that post and they said don't worry our product will be back in in stock soon you know don't worry about covid and then they used the hashtag covid now that was cited oh. in a warning letter so i like to say don't you know don't do rate don't do late night retweeting and, and reposting because a well-educated social media manager or a well-intentioned rather social media manager can definitely mm -hmm. sink a company just by doing what they're used to been doing in other countries yeah. or perhaps other industries such as tech or apparel these things from other countries or different industries here in the u.s don't necessarily translate into effective and compliant marketing strategies in, in the usa yeah 
Well, in China, they, they now are, are working on legislation for live streaming because live streaming is such a huge thing in China. And it's like, you know, some of these really popular key opinion leaders or KOLs would get on on live stream on Taobao or one of the major platforms and, you know, millions of followers, they would tune in and they could move. I mean, there's tons of stories and examples. I won't go into them, but I mean, they could move product like, you know, a hundred thousand units within 30 minutes of a product. And it, and it's, so China, you know, said, well, this is advertising because you're, you were, you were up there saying what this product is, you know, kind of like, you know, um, TV shopping online, basically, they'll have a person up there holding the product saying what it does, it's wonderful, blah, blah, blah. And then people are, you know, have a way to buy it right there on that platform. So this is really um, an interesting time that I think COVID has kind of, this was going to happen anyways, but I think COVID has really kind of sped up that process of, you know, where we are digitally and, uh, and where the regulations are. That's fascinating to hear that story about China. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't aware of the key opinion leaders in that. that. That's great. Thanks for bringing that up. I would like to also say in the US, the Federal Trade Commission has some wonderful guidance for companies that are looking to set up best practices for influencers or uh, you know, digital, digital marketing. There's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of guidance. The FTC puts out a lot of great information, supporting documents on what do you do um, if you're a Instagram influencer? How do you disclose this? Because everything has to be disclosed. It can't be hidden. Uh, you know, and, and that can be as simple as hashtag sponsored. And that can't be the 30th, 30th hashtag on the post. It can be, has to be above the line or the first couple. So the FDA has some great guidance on, on, on that too. And if anybody you know, can't find that, they can, they can check out my website where I've got a lot of links to helpful resources on my website, which is my name, asawaldstein.com. Awesome. So before we wrap up, what, what about, because there's a lot of kind of hidden, not really hidden, but there's a lot of things people would overlook um, in terms of regulatory, like California's Prop 65 and some other props. So l just touch on those quickly before we head out. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> well, Prop 65 is a great example, Jeff. I, I used to, my silly joke, and it's really true, is I had a lot more hair on my head before I heard about Prop 65, and I got a <laughs> Prop 65 lawsuit. It can be really expensive. I think it costs the company I was running at that point around $120,000. So for those of you who may not know, Prop 65 is a state regulation that requires anything that's on this chemical list. It's over 900 chemicals and lead, arsenic, even BPA that is contained in a lot of packaging can be on that list. So if a company is coming from abroad, their packaging or their labels may contain one of these chemicals that's on the Prop 65 list, like BPA. And if it's not labeled correctly, that can lead to a, a pretty expensive lawsuit. Ouch. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot. I mean, it's one, I think the US market is very, um, you know, people say it's not regulated for supplements. A lot of countries, China, when we work with the FDA in China, they always said that, oh, they're not regulated. Of course we are. And I, the analogy I use is kind of like a speed limit. There is a law on the highway that says you can only drive, you know, 65 miles an hour and you're expected to follow it. And when you're not, and you're going above that, the police are there to get you. And in this case, it's the FTC or FDA to get, to, to get you. So we're definitely regulated, but it's very open and transparent, everything is online. You've got a lot of great links on your website that you know lead people to these answers if they, you just need to read um, and sit down and read through it. Um, but we'll put a, you know, at the end we'll have a name card so people watching, if they wanna grab, you know, jump on your website and check those out, that'd be uh, awesome. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for having me here. This has been really fun. The last comment that I wanted to very briefly make is, when you're, when you're looking to enter the U.S. market, you want to engage with your consumers. So we talked about what you can't do. You know, don't say anxiety. You know, don't, you know, don't make, inadvertently make these drug claims on hashtags. But what can you do? So just with what my one-minute synopsis of this is cultivate authentic consumer excitement. So how do you do that? You tell your company story. You can talk about the founders. You can talk about this wonderful herb that was grown in the highlands of you know of China and it's a family farm and here's a video of our family farm but then we partnered with our company in the US to manufacture this by being authentic that's a great way to just definitely connect with the with mm. the consumers here in the US and it's compliant because they're not making any claims 
Yeah, that's definitely. I mean, I, I think, especially in this era and this time, the, the one thing people are looking more and more for, especially the younger generation that are very savvy online, looking things up is transparency. And, and that exactly what you just mentioned, not only does that build a great story, but it also builds transparency and people are like, oh, okay, this is where this product comes from. And there's the guy cutting it down from the tree or, you know, the family pulling it out of the ground and then it makes its way to, you know, this place. And then it's, you know, eventually ends up in this, this dosage format that I'm taking. It's, it kind of has that two prong awesome thing, nice story for marketing purposes and, 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 and loyalty and engaging the consumer in what you're doing. And then also the fact that you're like, this is how we do it. It's kind of transparency. Yep. I love that. Love that indeed. Awesome. Asa, thanks so much for your time. And anyone that's interested in learn more about Asa, you can go on his website. We'll put the name card on there and you can go and check it out. Hope to That's see it. you. Yeah, hope to see you in person one of these days. I, you know, everyone's getting uh, vaccinated and, uh, you know, um, what is it? Expo East is coming up, a uh, live event. And, uh, you know, so I think moving into 2022, we're going to have all of our live events back, Expo West and Supply Side and Vita Foods and all these great shows around the world. So hope to see you there face to face. It'd be great. Yeah, I look forward to it, Jeff. Thank you so much for inviting me on here and a big warm greeting and thanks to everyone out there. I look forward to seeing you at future trade shows. All right, so take care. Thank you for tuning in to HPA Global Insights. Please like, subscribe, and share with your colleagues. Any questions or suggestions, email us at info at uschinahpa.org. This channel is operated by U.S. China Health Products Association, which is a nonprofit organization. Please consider joining the association and supporting its global endeavors. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, take care.